Okay. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. So today I'm shifting gears from chromatography a little bit. I just wanted to give um, a little bit of introduction to what you're going to be doing in the lab next week, which is a new lab. Hence, this is a new kind of sort of put together lecture. So you, if you have a packet, you're not going to find it in the packet. It's on Canvas. So if you go to week three under lecture material, you'll find it on Canvas. Okay, so the purpose we included this uh, lab and this topic is it's, we find it's very crucial for students to know how to prepare the agents. And you don't get enough practice uh, doing that. It used to be part of chemical reactions, which is a course you take next semester, but we thought it's appropriate to have it here since food analysis is a prerequisite to analysis, uh, to chemical reactions, so it's good to have introduction on the agent, preparation of the agents of buffer and buffers before you go into uh, more advanced stuff. So throughout the semester, you'll be working with the agents, uh, and the TAs will prepare these reagents for you. And oftentimes our graduates leave and they don't know how to prepare a reagent or a buffer, which doesn't, which is not good. If, if you are a graduate student, if an advisor will expect you to know how to prepare a buffer. And if, even if you work in industry, you are expected to know how to prepare reagents. So we thought this is an appropriate exercise. So today you're going to be doing a lot of calculations. Some of these calculations are fresher from chemistry. Uh, classes that you've had before. So what I want you to do so that you feel a little bit of encouragement and excitement is take a sheet of paper and it will be for extra credit. Um, so let's do that. Everybody, sheet of paper and you need calculator. Put your name on it and before you leave, Leave that sheet of paper here. I'm, I will think if it's going to, probably a plus three is appropriate for this work. Um, okay. Just a quick check-in question to see what you know about buffers. What is true about a buffer? Anybody? A and C. What about you? All of the above. Who's going to side with all of the above? You don't have any alliance. Okay, who's going to side with A and C? All right, it's the true answer. The buffer doesn't necessarily have to be neutral. A buffer it means it's a reagent that will resist change in pH. Does anybody know when we need to use a buffer? Okay, Sam. Uh, titrations. We are we're going to have a pH and titratable acidity lab where we're going to uh, titrate and determine the concentration of food acids, organic acids, which act like a buffer. But usually when we use buffer, we want it in a reaction where we don't want the pH to change. So let's say we're doing an enzymatic reaction. We want to make sure that the reaction stays at a particular pH, whether the pH is 4 or 7 or 6. We just want to make sure that the reaction doesn't change. Because whenever there's a chemical reaction going on, there might be protons lost or OH groups gained or lost. So this will trigger a change in the pH. However, in the presence of a buffer, when there is a weak acid, the weak acid is going to give you protons if it, during the reaction there was a loss in proton. or the conjugate base is going to pick up a proton when there is an OH minus produced, for example. So 
So basically, the, the presence of the buffer is an exchange of um, protons where it will resist change in pH. So let's say you are titrating with uh, NOH, so you are giving the solution OH minus. So you are making the solution more alkaline. So if you have a buffer, the buffer is going to donate a proton and resist that change or the pH from going up. Or if you ha are titrating with an acid and then you're adding protons to the system, the conjugate base or the salt of the acid is going to pick up a proton and resist the pH from going down. So that's a simple illustration, it's a titration, to, to illustrate that if there is anything that will result in a freeing of a proton or pickup of a proton, the buffer is going to resist that change in pH. Okay. In order to prepare the agents, here's where we need to start, a pressure of a little bit, some concentration uh, equations. So what is a molarity? Molarity is moles of a solute per liter of a solution. And moles of a solute or number of moles equal mass of a particular reagent over its molecular weight. So these are equations you need to know, you need to remember to use when we are determining or producing a reagent at a particular concentration. Normality, you will come across it mostly when we refer to uh, concentration of acids and bases. So often instead of molarity, you see normality, and normality is related to molarity. It's basically number of moles equivalent of a solute per liter of a solution. Number of moles equivalent is basically number of moles of, if it's an acid-base reaction, it's number of moles of H plus or a OH minus. If it's not acid-base reaction, it would be the number of moles of the electrons transferred in a reaction. So basically, if we have um, H2SO4, for example, you have two protons, two hydrogens, or yeah, uh, H pluses. This means you have two, the number of mole equivalents of a solute is two. So the relationship between normality and molarity is that normality equals number of equivalents times molarity. So one molar of H2SO4 equals two normal of H2SO4. However, if you have HCl, for example, you have one proton. So one molar of HCl equal one normal of HCl. So for example, NOH, you have one mole of, or one number of equivalents is one OH. So one molar of NOH equal one normal of NOH. So if you see the molarity and normality of acid base, you will be able to convert from one to the other based on how many protons or how many uh, hydroxyl groups you have. Equivalent weight is something you are going to uh, come across when we determine the titratable acidity of um, acid or organic acids because organic acid will have multi sometimes multiple carboxyl groups. So you will have multiple protons that they can exchange. So in that equation, when we learn it later, we have to take into account the number of moles equivalent or that n value, this one here, number of mole equivalent. So equivalent weight will be the molecular weight divided by the number of mole equivalent. So for example, the equivalent weight of H2SO4, it's the molecular weight divided by two because you have two H's, it's 49. So keep that in mind, I will remind you of it when we get to titratable acidity chapter. Concentration can be also reported as percentage. Uh, it could be percent weight by volume, or percent weight by weight, or, or percent volume by volume. We usually tell you when we're giving you a percentage, you will be told if it's weight by volume, or volume by volume, or whatever. So it's basically the ratio of the weight to volume or volume to volume multiplied by 100. Um, sometimes concentration is not necessarily a percentage. It could be milligrams per 100 grams or milligrams per milliliter. So any, any amount per volume is a concentration. 
When concentration is much less than 1 percent, then we use the parts per million designation, which is milligrams per liter or micrograms per milliliter. That is a parts per million. You'll come across that as well. Parts per billion is microgram per kilogram or microgram per liter, and then parts per trillion and so on. So and, and you will have compounds that you would measure, like flavor, for example. You're going to go down to parts per billion or parts per trillion. So it's not uncommon to have that low over concentration. Something else that you will be using in calculation a lot, and we will be deriv derivizing or derivatizing equations, um, or deriving equations, not derivatizing, deriving equations, a lot using this uh, equation of neutralization, which is milli equivalent of one reactant equal milli equivalent of another reactant. We will go through that a lot throughout the semester when we are determining protein content or nitrogen percentage, when we are determining titratable acidity, when we are determining free fatty acids, when we are determining, oh, I can't stop listing, but there are a lot. You will be going through this reaction or equivalence a lot. So remember that milli equivalent is basically milliliter of um, certain solution multiplied by the normality of that solution at equilibrium would be equal to the milliliter of another solution with the normality multiplied by the normality of that solution. We will use it to derive many con uh, calculations and concentrations of different uh, com compounds later on. However, here we are going to use it for dilution protocols. A lot of the dilution schemes is based on multiplying milliliter of a stock solution, which is a concentrated solution of a particular reagent, by either normality or any form of concentration. Could be milligrams per 100 milliliter or percentage or whatever it is. It's a concentration equals milliliter of a working solution. What's the a final uh, volume you need to reach. I want to prepare 200 milliliter of certain reagent, 500 a liter, so that would be it. And the normality or the concentration of the final solution. I want to point one normal, or I want uh, 25 milligrams per 100 milliliter of a solution. Whatever is the final solution concentration that I need. And then often you are solving for X, solving for how much what, how much do I need of a stock solution to get a certain amount of the final solution with a particular concentration? So for example, if I have a solution, stock solution of 12 normal HCl, how can I apply this equation to prepare one liter of 0.1 normal HCl? So start with that, using that sheet of paper. And <laughs> before you hand me your sheet of paper, take a picture of it at the end of class so that you have the solutions for all these questions. Whoever has a number, go ahead. And when you get to a number, you want to tell me what do you do with it. If you're in a lab and you figured out how much you need, what would you do next? Anybody with a number? We're just solving for x here. So what's the normality of your stock solution? 12. What is the final volume that I need in milliliters? 1,000. What's the final concentration I want? 0.1. 
So I'm solving for how much do I need to take out of my stock solution? Alex? Yes. What would you do with it now? Exactly. So basically, when I ask you to calculate in order to prepare a reagent, you want to finish it. You want to say, yes, okay, I got 8.33 <coughs> or 8.3 milliliters of HCl. I get a volumetric flask. I put a little bit of water in there because it's always for safety, acid over water rather than water over acid. A little bit of, a little bit of water and then my 8.3 milliliters and then I make up the volume with distilled water. And there is your one liter of 0.1 normal HCl. Okay, <coughs> let's calculate number of moles. What's the number of moles of calcium in 25 grams of calcium chloride to hydrate, hydrate. So what you need here is the molecular weight of this molecule. So calcium is 40 grams per mole, the molecular weight of calcium. Chloride, 35.5. Hydrogen, 1. Oxygen, 16. How many calcium do I have in this e molecule? 1. So 1 mole of calcium chloride to, to water molecules, 1 mole of that equals to 1 mole of calcium. Okay. So if I determine the number of moles of this compound, it will be equal to number of moles of calcium because I do have one. So here you need to apply what equation? Anybody who's solving, what equation are you using to get the number of moles? Number of moles equals? mass over molecular weight. So you have the mass, you can calculate the molecular weight, you will get the number of moles. Anybody with an answer? Nobody with an answer? Ah, yeah, Riley. 6.8? Hmm. 6.8, you got it? Well, how did you get that? What's the, mo <laughs> what's the molecular weight? Okay. And then the mass is 25 grams over 147 grams per mole. 25 divided by 147. Huh, Alex? No, no, no. First, you want the number of moles, right? And we said that since there's only one calcium, here's the trick. So one mole of this molecule is equal to one mole of calcium. So you have one calcium in there. It's moles, not grams. So you get the number of moles of this, and that number of moles of this compound is equal to number of moles of calcium because you only have one. Huh? You, thought you overthought it. Okay. You want to prepare one liter of 0.2 molar NOH. You have two different stock solutions. 
Let's say you have a stock solution that is 3 molar NOH. How would you prepare? And if you don't have this, you have 45% weight by volume NOH as a stock solution. How do I obtain 1 liter 0.2 molar NOH? So let's solve the first one, which is easy, the first one, right? You have the same concentration, molarity. So when you have the same concentration unit, you apply the equation, m by v equal m by v. Anybody? The first one is a simple. Daniel, do you have a question? Do you know what we're going to use? Which equation here to solve? Okay, so we have the equation, which is volume times concentration equal volume times times concentration. This is for your stock solution. This is for your uh, end solution that you want. So, Daniel, you're going to prepare one liter. And you have the same concentration unit. You have molarity and molarity, so that's easy. Yes, so you would equate that times 0.2 molar here, and we are solving for this volume from the stock the stock is 3 molar. So the volume, you just solve for x, basically. You get the volume. So who has, OK, Nathan? Yes, 66.6 or 0.7 milliliter. Again, you complete the answer by saying you take 6.66 milliliter or 66.7 milliliter, and you put it in a volumetric flask and make up to volume by water. All right, the next one. What's, what do you need to do as a first step? You have a percentage and you have a molarity over there. So the first step before you calculate a volume, what do you need to do? Something we learn in math usually and early chemistry. When you have two different units, what do you want to do? Huh? Convert. So you need to convert 45% to a molarity. Okay, great. Any idea how you do that? Talk out loud before you solve. Let's figure that out before you solve. So you have a percentage, and I'm saying weight by volume. Exactly. So I use the molecular weight, but I do. I need to convert this to weight per liter because now I have 45 grams per 100 milliliter. It's a percentage, right? So 45% weight by volume is 45 grams per 100 milliliter. Molarity is per liter. So I need to convert to the amount per thousand milliliter, not per hundred. Okay? So what do I get? Forty five grams in a hundred, what would be the amount in a liter? You actually you multiply four fifty, yes. So four fifty grams per liter. So now you have the mass. So you have the mass the molecular weight, okay, so what is the molecular weight of sodium? 23, and then uh, O16 and H1. So that is 40, right? So you have 45 or 450 grams over 40 grams per mole. That 
that is eleven point two five moles, and since molarity is moles per liter, so the molarity is eleven point two five moles per liter because we calculated the amount per liter. So 11.25 moles per liter. Now I have moles and moles. I can apply the same equation here, volume times concentration equals volume times con concentration after I unified the units. So here we go. So I'm solving for x. I got 17.8 milliliter. That would be what, how much I need to take out of my stock solution and then make it up to volume with water. Okay, ready to move on? I'll move on as soon as I see everybody ready. Okay. All right. Yeah? So if your grams are canceling, then you end up with a volume. Um, yeah, and here if the grams cancel and the mole goes up, then you end up with a mole. So yeah, that's an important point to show when you show calculation in your lab report. Just lay out your equations with your units, and then they cancel, and you know that you got the right answer. OK. so. Often you are preparing um, an acid, let's say, solution from a stock solution that you get from um, the supplier, and the supplier present a concentrated acid as a percentage. Okay, so usually concentrated H2SO4, we purchase it as a bottle with 98% purity, volume by volume. So this is how we purchase it. And then you want to prepare 500 milliliter of 0.1 molar H2SO4. Okay, so I have a volume, I don't have a weight, a mass. And I need a mass for my calculation. I need mass of a molecular weight. So the bottle states the density of H2SO4. So I have the density, I have the volume, I should be calculating the mass in percentage. At least that's the first point. And then you have to carry that out, need to determine the molarity of your stock H2SO4 solution because your final solution is 0.1 molar. So I need to unify my concentration. So that's what I need to do. And then the molecular weight of H2SO4 is 98. So you have all the given, and I already told you that you want to find the weight in percentage. You want to convert this to weight by volume, weight by 100 milliliter. So how can I convert that? You have the density. So solve that first step and let me know what you get. So what's the weight or mass per 100 milliliter?
Did anybody reach that far? Using the density? One hundred and eighty, eighty-four. Huh? I got one eighty-two. I have one eighty point something. Do you want to recheck your calculator? So basically, what you do is density equals mass by volume. So you have your volume and you have your density. The density is 1.84 grams per milliliter. And then your mass is what you're solving for, and then the volume is uh, 98. So this times that equal your mass. So your mass would be one, if you, 180, if you round just with the significant figures, 180. And that is 180 in, this is in 100 milliliter, okay? Because 98 milliliters is a percentage is in 100 milliliters. So that <coughs> amount is in 100 milliliter. So now you, the same as the previous example, you have to convert to the amount per liter. So you multiply by a 10. So that is times a thousand over a hundred. So you get your concentration, how much you have in a liter. How much do we have in a liter? You multiply by 10. So we have 100, 1,800 grams in one liter of my original bottle. So now I can get what, from here, I have the mass. What do I do next? I'm after molarity. So what's the intermediate step? Is getting the number of moles. So number of moles equals my mass over molecular weight. So it's 1,800 grams in 98 grams per mole. So what's my no number of moles? Ted? 18.4 moles. So this amount was in a liter, so now my molarity equals 18.4 moles per liter. So now I have the molarity of my stock solution, then I do the same thing. I want to prepare 500 ml of 0.1 molar, that would be 500 times 0.1 equals to 18.4 times x milliliter. And that's what you do. I don't know why this ever, does anybody ever use this? This room is not so great in terms of those in the back being able to see all of this. Any questions on this type of calculation? Please don't be shy. You, I know that this has been done in previous chemistries, but you might have forgotten it, so I'm happy to repeat anything. Okay. Are we good? Again, since this is acid, you would bring a volumetric flask, you put a little bit of water, Add your 2.72 milliliter of H2SO4 and then bring up, well, not to one liter, sorry, typo, bring up to 500 ml. Haha, -ha, don't copy that. Does it carry over? Ah. 
I lost my tears. You can't say it? Oh, sorry. <sighs> All right. Dilutions. So we're still diluting. But this is an example you'll be doing in some, something similar in the lab. So you want to prepare a series of standards. We talked about plotting calibration um, or standard curves when we were talking about data analysis. So in terms of determining unknowns in a sample, you usually prepare a series of known concentrations and then you do a measurement and you plot the measurement against different concentration and you have your standard curve. We talked about that in data analysis. You'll be doing that in different labs, in the caffeine lab, in the carbohydrate lab, in the atomic absorption lab, you'll be constructing standard curves. So in order to prepare your standard curve, you need to prepare your standard solutions. And oftentimes you have a stock solution and from there you have a series of dilutions to get to a certain concentration or a series of concentrations you need. So this is an example. You are going to measure anthocyanins in a juice using a colorimetric method. You don't know how much anthocyanin you have in your juice, but you can construct a standard curve using standard anthocyanin. So the method, the colorimetric method, you need to prepare 2 ml of samples. So you need to prepare 2 ml of your standards because that's what the uh, what, that's what the assay calls for. So your final volume of the different concentrations is 2 ml. You have a stock solution of 16%. I'm telling you it's weight by volume, i.e. grams in 100 milliliters. And you need solutions of zero, that's your blank, basically nothing in there, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0 0.5. Notice the concentration here milligrams per milliliter is your final concentration. Design a dilution scheme to prepare 2 ml of each concentration. Give it a go. You have like three minutes to think on your own because we have to get to buffer. <laughs> What's the first step? Uh, give him plus three, please. Plus three. Thank you. Because nobody else wanted to say anything. See? Encouragement. Talk. Positive reinforcement. Okay. All right, so that's your first step, is com making the unit here same as here. How do I convert 16 grams per 100 ml to milligrams per milliliter? Zach. Yeah, so 16 times what? Grams to milligrams? 1,000. So now we get 16,000 milligrams in 100 ml. In 1 ml, you're dividing by 100. Okay, so now I have the concentration of my stock solution in milligrams per milliliter. Now what? Okay. So what do I get? How much do I need of my stock solution to prepare 2 ml of, we're starting with 0 0.1. 
0.1 milligrams per ml. Okay. One point two, you're off by a decimal. Uh, it's not one point two unless I did something wrong. Can anybody else? I got twelve point five microliters. Twelve point five microliters. Here's the calculation. I'm going to go through this with you because I need to move to buffers. So we got 60, 160 milligrams per ml by converting the units. And then I apply this equation, concentration by volume equal concentration by volume. I get, I get X to be 0 0.0125 milliliter. This is 12.5 microliter, too small too small of a unit. We don't have a pipette uh, that will read 2.5 microliters. 12.5 microliters. Too small. So when you make that calculation, you go, I cannot do this directly. I have to have a dilution in between. So I go, OK, let me dilute the stock solution 10 times. If I dilute the stock solution 10 times, let's say I'm going to prepare 10 ml of a diluted solution, I take 1 ml in 10 ml. 1 ml of stock solution plus 9 ml of water is 1 ml in 10 ml. This gives me 16 milligram per milliliter. That is 10 times diluted, 10 times less. Okay. So I dilute it 10 times, and then I apply the equation. Now, instead of 12.5 microliter, I get 125 microliters, which is perfect. I do have pipettes, mechanical pipettes, that allow me to take 12, 125 microliter with confidence. So now I have a second stock solution. I prepared my 0.1 milligram per milliliter, two milliliters of those, then I apply the same thing using this second stock solution to calculate for uh, 0.2, 0.3, and 0.5. So you just apply the same equation and you will get those different values. Oh, this is not microliter, this is ml. 1.875 ml. One point eight seventy five milliliter plus one two five microliter gives you the two ml solution. And then you apply, like I said, same calculations for point two, point three, point five, and you get the volumes two fifty, three seventy five, six twenty five, respectively. So on your own piece of paper, make sure you have those calculations. But I'm gonna go on now. At five minutes, I'll at least I'll introduce buffer and we can finish those calculations on Monday. Buffers. A buffer, by definition, it has an acid and a conjugate base. Or you can hear, hear it as an acid and its salt, or acid and its corresponding salt or corresponding base all mean the same thing. Okay? So a buffer, it, it has both the weak acid and the base, and it stabilizes the pH of a solution. And the Henderson Hasselbalch equation kind of demonstrates this relationship. This equation is a very important equation. We use it to prepare buffers, and we use it to explain later on titratable acidity of your food organic acids later on. So you will see it come up again. But here, I'm going to talk about it in terms of its use to prepare a buffer. Okay. 
So the buffering principle, I said the principle of a buffer is you have it if the solution resists change in pH. And the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is pH equal pKa plus log concentration of base or conjugate base or salt, all means the same thing, over the concentration of the acid. So the log of the ratio of the salt to the acid or the base to the acid. What's the definition of pKa, food chemistry? Remember that from food chemistry. What's the definition of pKa? Dissociated, yes. The pKa is at the pH or is the pH at which you have equal concentration of the acid and its conjugate base. Equal concentration of non-dissociated and dissociated. So this is a def different term of defining it. Not, disso not dissociated is the HA and dissociated is the A. So when the concentration is equal, then log of one is zero, then the pH equal the pKa, and that's when you have maximum buffering capacity. You're titrating with an acid, let's say, the A minus is gonna pick up the acid and resist change in pH, the, the proton. You're titrating with the base, the, the acid here is going to give a proton and neutralize the OH minus. So then you don't have a change in pH. So that's that. We have two minutes to think about this. And I will go through it at the beginning of lecture on Monday. But let's talk about a little bit of how to approach this problem. And maybe you can think about it at home. And anyway, you have to read your lab addendum, which has a sample calculation in it. We'll explain how to approach it. But remember that when we want to prepare a buffer, the final concentration of the buffer that we want to obtain, in this case, is one molar, the concentration of acid plus concentration of base should be equal one molar at the end. If you have that concept in mind, you should be able to approach this by applying the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Okay. So one molar equal concentration of base plus concentration of acid. Your pH equal pKa. Here I'm giving you the dissociation factor of acetic acid. You can calculate pKa by using the minus log dissociation factor. You can get that. And then here in this equation, what you can do is you can say A minus, and here 1 minus HA, so you substitute it. One minus, no, not HA, A minus. One minus A minus is HA, so you, you substitute HA with one minus A. Okay, one minus your concentration of conjugate base. So you have the pH of the buffer that you need at the end and you calculate the pKa, then you solve for A minus, okay? Then you get the concentration of the conjugate base, and one molar minus that molar concentration, you get the concentration of the acid. And we'll take it from there. Please read the addendum. It's very important that you read the addendum before coming to lab because this lab is unique. Hold on, don't start moving. This lab is unique because you're going to be doing 
a lot of calculations in lab before going on with your um, preparation of reagents. Some of the calculation you're going to do as a pre-lab quiz, some of it in lab. And the results section of your lab report will be your, all of your calculations. You're not collecting data, you're calculating. Okay, so what I want to show you is what we're doing. We're preparing several reagents. M many of them you'll be using in future labs and a buffer. You're going to practice all the calculations, many of them we discussed today. Please, it would be good for you if you read chapter two and three. It will give you a little bit of background information on buffers and dilutions. And then print, print and read lab addendum. It's already posted on Canvas. Please bring it with you to lab. And complete pre-lab quiz. Bring lab addendum, calculators, and laptop. You might not need particularly laptop because there's no data you're collecting in an Excel sheet, but definitely a good calculator. And make sure you update your lab notebook, just in case someone needs to look at them next week. All right, have a great weekend.